Today we're going to take another look at the process of backing up and saving your Linux image for your 3D printer install. Hello everyone, Chris here. This is a topic that we've talked about in the past. I've tried to give you some tips on how to deal with your Linux OS install for your 3D printer configuration, and it seems like it should be pretty easy to do, but it's not, unless you already run the Linux OS. Now you have to have a separate computer to be able to do this, and most of my machines are still running Windows. It can be done, but the process can be a bit painful. Now why would you want to do something like this in the first place? Well if you have a configuration that you like, and you want it to be stable, you don't necessarily want to update it very often, you might want to save a copy of that in case your SD card gets corrupted, the one that's running on your 3D printer. And this is a great way to do that, but these files can be very, very large so somewhat unmanageable. So I'm going to show you what I know how to shrink it down so that you can load it onto your computer, so you can share it with someone else, or just have a safe copy for later in case things go wrong. So let's get into it and I'll explain as I go. For this video I will be using the Big Tree Tech Pi 2. It has a lot of great improvements over Pi 1. If you're looking for a solution, a Raspberry Pi like board, definitely check this one out. But just imagine that this board has my printer configuration on it, I've made all kinds of updates, and I don't want to ever lose it. So that's where we're at, where we need to make a copy of the OS that this board runs. And for this video, I will be using SanDisk Extreme SD cards, 32 gig. You can do this with any size card, just beware, we do have to deal with that 32 gig space. So hopefully your computer has a large drive. And the extreme cards do read and write a lot faster, so the wait time is a lot less. And again, I'm just using this board and this install to show you what to do, how to deal with the OS. So imagine there's a printer plugged into this, you're going to see some errors because I don't have a main board cabled to it. But I can give you some tips and tricks. Imagine this is your Clipper install, you've got your printer.cfg and your board files exactly how you want them, and you don't want to lose any of those settings. So first thing, just take kind of a rough backup. So your printer.cfg, just right click and download it. That's the most important one. If you do have tool boards like I do, I've got a CAN board on this one, download that config as well. Again, just right click, download. That way you have the two most important files if things go really sideways. The next thing I would do is just come down to the bottom here in machine, at least that's in main sale, and just update all components. So before you take a backup like we're getting ready to do, you will have the newest changes to all the firmware, at least at the date that the backup's being taken. It might not hurt to write down the day you take this backup. Now I got an update error on Moonraker. It doesn't matter, there was a repo missing or something like that. Not important for this video, but I would suggest you go ahead and take a snippet, just a screenshot, of all these versions before you get ready to take that backup. Just in case you need to roll back, this might be good info to have. And just save this with the date that you took the backup. Once you're all set with your updates and you have your two configuration files downloaded, just come up here to the power button and shut down. We definitely don't want to power the Pi off. We want to shut it down gracefully before we take a backup. This just makes sure that everything on the card is in working order before we take a copy. Give it a couple of seconds to shut down, make sure there's no blinking lights or anything like that, and then go ahead and remove the power from the Pi, and then we'll pull the SD card. So I'll just load the SD card on the computer. You're going to get an ugly error because one of these partitions is Linux, Windows doesn't know what to do with it. We'll just cancel that. But we'll just head into File Explorer, and you should see that card mounted. You'll have boot, and then another one where the Linux stuff lives. Now, the easiest way to take a copy of that card just to create a backup is with Win32 Disk Imager. You can use a lot of different tools, but it's a very simple tool. You can just go download it. I'll leave a link to it in the description. But here's the tool. So we've already got our card mounted. It's going to be the first device letter. We're just going to call it D here. That's what the computer knows it as, but it's going to get everything on the card, both the partitions. 
and we're just going to click this folder. Select the location where you'd like to store the image. Remember, it's going to be 32 gig. It will be the same size as the card because it's an image. It's everything on the card. And we'll just call it Pi Image. And it does have to have a .img at the end so the computer knows it's an image file. And we'll open. And we'll just hit read. Now it's going to read everything on the SD card, even if it doesn't have anything in it, and create an image file that's the same size as the card. And we're done, right? We're creating an image backup of that card. We're storing it on our computer. We will have an image that we could use to rewrite that SD card, make copies, all that good stuff. No problem. Well, the issue is it's going to be 32 gig. If you have a 64 gig card, it's going to be 64 gig. And that's a really large file to deal with. It's just chewing up space for no reason. So we have to shrink it. Now, again, that seems like a really easy task. But since this is a Linux OS, we have to pretty much do it in Linux. And you can't do it on your Raspberry Pi because that card is where your OS lives that you need to shrink. So unless you have another Linux machine you can mount it on, you're pretty much out of luck. But there is a tool in Windows that allows you to do something like this. And it's really not so much of a tool as it is a Linux operating system, but it's called WSL, or Windows Subsystem for Linux. And you can install this a number of different ways, but we don't need anything fancy. We just need a Linux OS to run a few commands in. So the easiest way to do it is with just a one-liner. You do have to have a pretty new version of Windows 10. Windows 11 works as well. But if you just go to your start key and type in CMD, that'll bring up the command prompt right here. If you right click on it and run as administrator, we can just enter one command, WSL space dash dash install. And this will get everything you need to run that Linux system. Now you do need an internet connection so that it can download the things that it needs, but depending on the internet connection speed, it should only take a couple of minutes to run, but it does require a reboot. So we'll get that done now. After your reboot, if everything went well, WSL should bring up a window and start installing the default version of Linux. I believe it is already Ubuntu, but that's the one I would have chosen anyway. Doesn't really matter, we just need some flavor of Linux to run a couple of commands. But this is the window, you're now running Linux under Windows. So we can get the things we need done, done. Now we can go ahead and close this, and I'll show you how to get back into it. But we're gonna open up File Explorer again. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom on the left hand pane, you're going to see Linux. This is how you can interact with the files on the Linux side of the machine that's now been installed. You have a home directory with your user that you use on Windows. This is where you should keep everything just because that will have the proper permissions for you to use them. And while we're here, we need to get our image, this giant 32 gig one we just created with Win32 Disk Imager. You can see when I ho hover over it, it says 29.7 gig. I'm going to right click and copy that and I'm going to paste it over on the Linux side of the house in my home directory. That way we can interact with it with the Linux side of this OS. It'll take just a little bit to copy. While that's working, all you have to do to get back into command line for WSL, go to your Windows key and just type in WSL. You'll see the little penguin. You click on that that'll get you back to your Linux command line. So yeah, I get it. We had to install Linux on our Windows machine just to run a couple of commands to shrink our image for our Clipper install so we could save it. Yeah, that's what we had to do. But hopefully with the commands that I'm giving you, it's just a one-liner. You can run these commands and then forget about the whole thing. So let's get back to it. So once our image is copied over to the Linux side of the house, you could do this with some mounting, but I'm trying to make this as easy as possible for a non-Linux user. But now we need to head out to the web browser and get a thing called PyShrink. You can just Google PyShrink 
but there's a GitHub page for it. It's completely open source. Thank you, Drew, for creating this. I've used this many times over the years. But if you scroll down, it'll tell you all the things you need to do to use it and install it. It's just three short commands. We're going to download it from GitHub. So we'll take this we git command right here. We'll copy that and we'll paste it in WSL. Remember to be in your home directory. That is your default directory. But if you've been browsing around, go back to tilde, cd tilde. That'll get you there. But we'll download it. It's just a single shell script, one file. We're going to chmod it to get it to the correct permission so that we can execute it. Again, just copy and paste off the GitHub. And then we're going to move the script into user local bin. This allows you to run the script from any directory on the Linux side. So let's copy that, paste it in WSL. You do need your root password. It's the same password as your ID that you log into Windows. But now that that's over in user local bin, you can run pyshrink.sh from anywhere. And that's good because now we can shrink any image no matter what directory it's in. And they show you how to run the command out here on GitHub. It couldn't be any easier. You do need elevated permissions, so you'll do sudo pyshrink.sh and then the name of your image file. Ours was in our home directory, so you can just do ls. There's our py underscore image, so it'd be sudo pyshrink.sh py underscore image. You can highlight it and right click to copy and then right click again to paste and just hit enter. Now it's removing all of the empty space off of that image to get it down to a little bit easier size to deal with. Doesn't take very long at all. We went from 30 to 5.4 gig, not too bad. Now, if you do an LS, it's gonna be in the same directory that it was before, it's just been shrunk. It's the same image file. If you do an ls-als, that'll let you see the sizes and the permissions. You can see that image right there. It's about five and a half gig. Now, if you go back to your file explorer, there's your pi image. Just refresh it. It's now five and a half gig. You can right click this and copy it and put it wherever you'd like. Or you could just use it from this location, whatever you want to do. But I'm going to copy it back to my desktop. And I'm just going to replace that 32 gig image we created with System Imager. And just to show you that that image is exactly the same as the one we pulled off our existing OS, the one that worked, I put in a new SD card. This one just happens to be 32 gig. I'm going to pull my Win32 Disk Imager tool back up. This time, I'm going to select the image file that we shrank. Remember, it's back on the desktop. It's now 5 gig. That's how we know it's the new one. We'll hit open. We'll select our empty SD card. There's nothing on it. And we'll hit write. And we are sure it's a new volume. There's nothing on it. That's what we want to write to. It will overwrite whatever's on there. Our image write is successful. I'll move this error. Write successful. Go ahead and hit OK and exit. But it has written two partitions because we're getting this error again. One of them is Linux. You can now see boot and F just like we did before. Boot has all of our files in it. It's exactly like the card that we just removed from our Pi. And to prove it, let's go ahead and boot up. So I'll remove it from the computer. We'll load it on our Big Tree Tech Pi version 2, and we'll power up. After a couple minutes, it starts connecting again. You can see mainsail. And we're back with mainsail up and running. We've got all of the same versions. All of our configuration files are here. We have successfully restored our Clipper install from a backup of the SD card. And one last thing, I'm going to pull open PuTTY so that I can connect to our OS install 
on our Raspberry Pi or Big Tree Tech Pi. And most Linux splash screens will probably already show this, but you have usage 16% of 29 gig. It automatically grew that image after it booted up. Most OS, they're going to do that nowadays. So you don't have to worry about resizing it. And if you just want to take a look, you can do a DF space minus H to display file system. You can do a rough count down through here, how big things are, but there's the bulk of the file system right there, 29 gig. That's what you can expect to see from Linux on a 32 gig card. You're good to go. You can make as many backups as you want, upload that file, that five and a half gig file to GitHub, share it with other folks as part of your project. You could even compress it down even more if you'd like before you uploaded it. There's lots of different tools out there. But five and a half gig is gonna be a lot easier to deal with than 32. So there it is, the fastest process that I can come up with to shrink down one of these images so it's just a little bit more manageable. Now remember, this will work with your Raspberry Pi, your Big Tree Tech Pi, anything Pi-like, anything that runs Linux, even your eMMC, if you wanted to get that over to your computer. There's lots of tools to do that. You just have to have the adapter. It works with any Linux OS. You can use the same process. So hopefully you found this helpful. That's it for today, and I'll see you really soon on the next one.